And right now, I'm so pleased to welcome Yusuf to Q. How are you? Nice to see you. Thank you. I'm um, very well. You know, we're sort of um, surviving. Uh, yeah, so things are okay. It's very hot, and, uh, you know, this is Dubai, so you expect that. Before we talk about Tea for the Tillerman 2, I'd like to talk about Tea for the Tillerman uh, 1, I guess. You know, uh, 50 years ago in 1970. Looking back, what kind of person were you back then? Who made that record in your mind? I think the guy who made that record is pretty easy to uh, to discover when when <clears throat> just listening to the words, um, because it was a kind of a spot on description of where I was, you know, at that time. And all my lyrics kind of uh, were, were sort of put out there as an expose in a way of, of who I was and what I was doing, what I was looking for. Um, so you could say well, when you come to a question like. Well, which were you, you know, the father or the son? That's something which it's another matter because I, I, in, that, in that particular song, I take two roles. I adopt both roles, you know, although I kind of veer towards the son uh, more than I did the, the father, and I still do, actually. So, um, But, um, yeah, so that's, that's where I was. You know, so if you look, talk about miles from nowhere, I was, I was in love with everything, but I couldn't couldn't really attach myself to anything. And that, that, was, that was the problem. Does it yeah. feel like a different person? Do you still feel like the person who made the record? No, oh, God almighty, I keep on getting the royalties for those songs and I deserve it. It's me, <laughs> I wrote them. <laughs> you, better, you better feel like otherwise, that person. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I feel I'm cheating somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, it's easy to look back at our younger selves and not even recognize ourselves, you know? Um, well, I must admit, when I listen to some of the interviews that I did in those days, I really do shudder. Um, you know, I wrote, I wrote what I thought and I wrote how I felt, and, um, and I was able to do that very well. But when it came to talking about it, that, that was a problem because I just, you know, was, I was an artist and I just, that was the way... I express myself, and that's how I could express myself. It was through my songs and through my lyrics. Um, so when I look at some of those interviews, that I really do shudder. I think, wow, <laughs> I wish I could have controlled him, you know. But um, that's experience, that's age. Well, you know, that's you're doing, you're doing great so far here today. Fifty years has been very good to you. You know, you're doing, great, you're great. doing great. Um, did you know? <laughs> did you know in 1970 that you had done something special with this record? Did you know then? Uh, not really. I, I mean, I, I, we did what we did, and we did it well. And we knew that we were doing something for pos for posterity. You know, I mean, I did work when with that, whenever I did an album. I did have this background in my mind that this was this was meant to last. You know, that that, that what we did, we did it as well as we could, and we we were as um, as honest as we could be, and we did the best art we could in, in musical terms. And, um, and so, but, but I didn't really know how, how my career was going to, you know, develop. It was perhaps that moment when um, Chris Blackwell, uh, you know, the sort of the chief, the boss of uh, Island Records, he took me up on the roof, you know, in Portobello Road near, near the Basing Street, his offices. And uh, he said, uh, after listening to Tillerman, he was just blown away. And he said, you don't know how big you're going to be. And I went, really? <laughs> you know, so obviously he knew something I didn't, um, but I was just doing what I did, you know, and, and, and that was that came naturally. So why, why redo it? Why re-record it? Well, the songs stand up um, incredibly well. If you like, uh, you know, up to this point, up to this time, yes, they were they were the songs of my time, but they're also the songs of this time too. You know, they, they haven't aged. Um, and it wasn't an idea, it wasn't my idea, it was my son's idea. I mean, he's the one who gets me into trouble. And he said to me, uh, well, we've got the 50th coming up, you know, the 50th year of Tillam. I said, really? Well, that was a shock already. I was like, wow. Um, and then he said, um, what are we going to do? And I said, well, you know, and then he came up with this idea. I said, why not? You know, the impossible. Yes. Um, but it wasn't a matter of doing it better because the album is already iconic, it's already made its mark, you know, it's kind of, it's in the hearts of so many, so many millions of people. Um, and the songs have taken the shape of, of you know, people's lives. 
Um, but now it's me sort of reclaiming the narrative. And for instance, um, hard-headed woman, well, I'm not looking for one anymore. I've got one, you know, <laughs> so I'll change the lyrics. <laughs> um, a song like uh, Road to Find Out, which is one of my favorites on the album. It was, um, you know, we've got into this, I've always loved blues and, and I've been listening a lot to desert blues, you know, like Tanaro and that kind of, yeah. you know, group. And, um, and so we got into this fantastic groove and, and that now takes on a completely new meaning uh, for the song, which is, which is fantastic. I love, I love what's happened to Road to Find Out. And, um, and on Father and Son, you, you duet with yourself, right? On Father and Son, you and duet father, with a younger yes. version of yourself. It's meaningful. I took meaning from that, you know? And here's the paradox. He's 50 years old. I'm only one year old. The guy that sang the, the younger part was recorded in 1970. But my part was only recorded last year. So that means he's 50 years older than I am. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. You know, it'll take time. It'll yeah, take time. I got You'll you. Get it. I found it. I found it there, yeah. <laughs> I think I have to go lie down for a couple of hours, but I got it. <laughs> so we took, we took the recording. We took the recording from um, the Troubadour 1970 recording. And, uh, you know, my, my sort of my genius engineer, you know, he kind of plucked it out digitally and everything. And he just placed it into this new recording. So what you've got is me singing the son's part from 1970 and me today singing the father's part. But I still I still veer towards the son. I, well, that's the thing. I, it's hard for me not to take. I mean, it's sort of my job to overthink these things, but it was hard not to be moved by that. You know what I mean? It was hard not to take some greater meaning for that, you know, in, uh, about getting older, about perspective, about aging, about changing. Like, I, I, I was quite moved by it, I must say. Yeah, well, it's, it's got an important message which, which continues to resonate. I mean, today, um, you know, it happens that once, you know, the people, as they grow older, they kind of get used to the scenery they want. They don't want to change too much. They don't want to kind of dive here or dive there. Whereas when you're forming your personality as a young age of 20 or whatever, um, or teenage, um, you know, years, you're really, really in that moment um, so dynamic. You could do anything. And that, by the way, you know, in those days, you sort of could do anything. I mean, I'd come out of the 60s, which really was open for anybody to do, to try any new idea. And if it worked, it worked. And um, now things are becoming more narrow. Um, and so you have a situation now where definitely people are feeling the, the restrictions of, of the time, you know, whether it's technology that's holding us down as a privacy and, you know, everybody knows what you like and, and, um, and you know, you're, you're on CCTV everywhere you go. It's, it's become much, much more restrictive. And so there is, there's a message there for, you know, I, I, I don't want to get, I want to get rid of this. I want to get rid of this feeling. I want to get free. I want to get, I want to get my liberty back. I want to get my personality, my freedom back. That still resonates today, right now. Did you feel like, a bit, you know, there's an interpretation of this where it's a bit like Leonardo going back and repainting the Mona Lisa. You know, you say that you say that they all hold up, but there's there's a there's a perfect record there made, and 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 you said there's not many perfect records, but Tiver the Tillerman is sort of one of them. Was there any trepidation about going back and sort of tinkering with it? No, not at all. <laughs> I, I, I kind of, and I went in and I went with a with black and white, and I painted Wild World with black and white. I mean, I went back to almost uh, chromatone, you know, sort of um, a feeling of going back into a place like Berlin in 1940. And I did this song again in this kind of club, almost like Casablanca, one of the songs you'd hear in that film, you know, with Humphrey Bogart. So um, I just, I did something, you know, joyous with it and I enjoyed doing it. And I wasn't really scared at all because it's my music. <clears throat> By the way, re recently, I mean, I've taken little bits of my songs from the past and I've redeveloped them as, as new songs as well sometimes. So it's mine to do, you know, it's artistic license. Well, yeah, you're, you're, listen, I'm not here to tell you you can't do anything and I'm happy that you did it. It just strikes me as uh, like how unprecious you are about it. I mean, these songs are, are so important to our world and these songs have meant a lot to so many people. And I, I, I find it actually sort of refreshing that you're sort of unprecious about your own music. You're kind of like, well, yeah, I did it. You know, I can kind of do whatever I want with it. 
Yeah, but I don't want to do it again. I'll never do it a third time, for God's sake, save me from that. <laughs> but um, yeah, but doing it once, you know, it's, it's an idea and it's a kind of a challenge and, uh, and it was fun. Now the album cover, of course, we had to do something different there Yes, too. let's talk so, about this. So can you give us an idea for people who are listening to this about what, what you changed on the album cover? Okay, so uh, now, now we have the Tillerman, kind of like the same scene, but now it's nighttime. So there's no kind of golden um, sun, you know, behind him. It's a, like it's turned into the moon and now it's nighttime and everything is much darker. And that's like the world that we find today. It's kind of, it's just darker. Um, and the two little kids, and they're still playing, but now what are they doing? One is listening to streaming on his earphones. The other one is looking at doing some gaming on his mobile phone. So things have changed, but the Tiller Man is the constant. You know, he's still there as the man of the earth, you know, waiting, you know, for things to get better on, the, on this planet. And, um, but he's prepared, he's got a space suit, he's got a space suit on now. <laughs> so in other words, no matter how much pollution there is around, he's gonna survive. Um, but he's drinking his tea, and you know, that's kind of, that harks back to, I suppose, the fact that I grew up, at, you know, with, a, with my dad's restaurant, and we were always serving tea. And um, so there you go, it's, it's, you know, he survives, he's come back 50 years later, he's found the world a darker place, but it doesn't bother him. He's still waiting for that happy day. You used an expression there that I think has become sort of um, strangely radical, which is, he wants things to be better. And in a time where we're, 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 we're in the middle of a global pandemic, there are protests against anti-black racism all over the world. We're addressing systemic uh, problems in our society. It's easy to get cynical and, and, and it's easy, it's harder to believe things can, can get better. So I'm, I'm wondering what you're seeing right now as someone who I can tell from just talking to you does see some hope in the world. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I wrote, Peace train, you know, that's that's like a yeah. It's it's hard, it's hard, it's hard for the guy to write peace train to be peace train to be uh, cynical, I suppose, you know. Yeah, and we take we say take this country home again, you know, and it's the same kind of theme as uh, as another song I love singing, which is the impressions, um, you know, um, uh, what's that song? Oh gosh, I guess I sing it now. Um, people get ready, yeah. You know, there's a train a coming. Ah, that's such a beautiful song. So it's it it means that um, light at the end of the tunnel. You just got to believe it. Um, and don't let anybody fool you into thinking anything other than that, because that's, that's where darkness takes over, where people uh, lose, you know, get into despair and, and start, start to um, lose their marbles, if you like. What, where does that hope come from? I mean, uh, natural hope is not something that is in everybody. Where do you think that comes from in your life? It's a fact that I haven't grown up. I mean, I think that when you're, you're a kid, you know, you ever remember that feeling kind of thinking that you've got something really interesting to do that day? Like, wow, you're getting excited about where you're going to go, uh, what's going to happen, you know, what the next thing's going to be. Um, I don't think I ever grew up quite. Uh, and so I think it's that, it's that expectation of something good, good's going to happen. You know, and I, I think that's the, the words of Peace Train have got it. But mind you, even I though... I believe something. Even, even though you haven't grown up, you do have perspective now that perhaps you didn't have when you were 21. You know, is, is there something that you've learned in these 50 years that you could pass on or you wish you could pass on to that 21-year-old singing Tea for the Tillerman? Well, let me think about that. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's probably I've written it somewhere, you know. You know, the answer lies within. Okay, that's, that's what I wrote in, in the song, uh, Road to Find It Out. And I think it's absolutely true. You know, you can, you, can, you can keep on trying to break down the walls of the establishment and everything else. But until you yourself are happy with yourself, you know, I don't know, I don't know what you're looking for beyond the wall. So, so in other words, people are now so used to blaming. I'm not saying there aren't people to blame. <laughs> Don't, don't get me wrong. But, you know, there is, there is there's an important priority system here, and that is that looking at yourself first. You could probably do some changes to begin with. And so there's a saying, you know, that, um, uh, you know, God doesn't change the condition of people until they change 
what is with them. So in other words, the moment you start to deal with what you've got in your own hands, that's when you start to enact change. You know, that's what Gandhi said, you know, be the change. Before we go, you're, you're holding up in the pandemic, all right? Yeah, thank God, yeah. Yeah, nothing, uh, you've been, it's been a lot of time with people being inside and starting to go, you know, worried about their mental health or, or worried about their families. You know, things have been okay? I've been so productive in this period of time. It's amazing. It's great because, you know, I, I could really concentrate on doing the things that I wanted to do and finish a lot of things, read a lot of books, um, you know, and, and, uh, and so really for me, it's been an incredibly productive time. Uh, I just, I've utilized it. Again, it goes back to that thing, you know, how do you utilize your time? How do you, um, you know, benefit from whatever condition you're in? That's, that's the job. That's the job we've got to do. So we're going to go out on the first song you released from your new album, Where Do the Children Play? How has this song um, changed for you over 50 years? Well, I mean, it's, it's just taken on a, a kind of a very prophetic sort of uh, meaning, you know? I mean, it's, it's absolutely continuously uh, meaningful in our world, and it's getting more meaningful as days go by. And I think also looking at the lyrics, it's not just about jumbo planes, because that was the year that, you know, jumbo planes started taking off. Um, but if you go towards the end of the song, you'll find that it talks about, you know, will you, about the problems that we might be facing in the scientific sphere, where with so much technology and, and the way that the medical science is moving, um, we really got to hold on to our true, humanity because in the end it says in the last verse you know will you tell us when to live or will you tell us when to die well you know that's that's not so much fiction anymore so we've got to be really careful about how we um how we utilize science and, and you know make sure that there are there, there, that we get a human being coming out the other end of it uh, you know, that, that's my message anyway in that song well, it's, it's been a joy to talk to you. Can I also say that your voice sounds great? Like your voice sounds, I was listening to the, I was listening to the re-recording and I was listening to the original recording. Your voice sounds pretty much the same. Like it's, it's, it's held up all right. Thank you so much. I, I had to change a couple of like semitones sometimes, um, but I, mostly, well, you'll find that for instance in, uh, I think it's uh, uh, Hard-Headed Woman, I just can't, this is a verse where I really, I used, to whack, you know, I used to whack it. I can't do that anymore, but I changed it into something else and it's, it's kind of come out melodious. It's beautiful. L lovely to meet you and, and take care and stay safe. You too. you too, Tom. Thank you very much. Goodbye.